All right. All right, uh, our uh, esteemed viewers, uh, uh, we are live uh, and we are happy to be uh, interacting with you for the uh, uh, for the for another edition of Axiom Talks. Um, this week, we are going to uh, be uh, interrogating a matter that we think uh, uh, is uh, is central to the hearts of many of you of, of us uh, Ugandans, but also uh, our colleagues in uh, in uh, the other African countries. Um, the topic we are discussing today is uh, corruption and whether uh, uh, there is hope um, 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 for us as citizens. Now, um, we are going to have two uh, esteemed uh, guests uh, and allow me to introduce uh, the first one that uh, is on set already. Uh, the, first set, uh, the first guest is Mr. Robert Rugolovi. Mr. Robert, Robert Rugolovi is a, an anti-corruption expert, but as, as well as an activist. He has uh, fought corruption in the trenches he started his anti-corruption work in 1999 uh, when he joined the Inspectorate of Government. Uh, he served there in various capacities until 2007 when he left uh, uh, and at the time of leaving he was the principal regional inspectorate officer uh, from the Inspectorate of Government. Uh, then he crossed over to join civil society and uh, he, uh, the organization uh, he joined does not come any bigger than Transparency International, Uganda chapter. Of course, there he served in different, uh, thereafter he served in different other capacities. He has also served uh, uh, as a donor. He worked with the Democratic <laughs> Governance Facility as Deputy uh, uh, Program and Learning Manager. And 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 but the interesting thing about Robert is that uh, he holds a master's degree in anti-corruption. There are not many activists that double uh, their activism with a degree with academic knowledge, but also a man who has uh, 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 co interacted with corruption uh, with anti-corruption work from the side of government, and then he came to civil society. And then I uh, joined the donor side. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Henry. Yes. And then uh, our uh, major, uh, main guest uh, has joined us, Honorable Olive Beth Kamiya Turiomwe. She's the new IGG, um, having been appointed in July this year. She, 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 she's also an academic giant. Because as I understand, she has authored over 200 articles, okay, uh, which have been published locally and internationally. She's an alumni of Makerere University. She worked as a, uh, 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 at a number of uh, public institutions, including Uganda Leather and Tanning Industries, based in Jinja. Uh, she has worked at Nyanza Textiles. Uh, she was also employed as uh, at, at Uganda Brewer is Limited as marketing manager. So from that perspective, she is no stranger to the private sector. And upon departing the company, then she was appointed as the executive director of Uganda Wildlife Education Center. It's while there that we came, we, we came to see and test her expertise in terms of organizing and management because she lifted this institution from an organization that was less known about to an organization that was uh, reigning supreme in terms of, of performance. Uh, and so the organizational culture that she left in place is something we always continue to reflect on and hope that she can replicate the same fit uh, there. But she also has a, a very extensive political career. Uh, between 2001 and 2004, uh, while still at uh, Uganda Wildlife Education Center, she became an official political. Uh, uh, she joined 
the political pressure group reform agenda. You remember very well, uh, um, this was the precursor to FDC as a political party. But from 2005 and 2010, she served as a special envoy on the FDC president, uh, Kiza Besige's, uh, she served as a special envoy for Kiza Besige. She's also a founder of the uh, and reigning president of Uganda Federal Alliance. And, uh, and uh, of course, she's also a former minister of lands, housing and urban development, uh, a, a position she held uh, uh, up until 2000, May 2021, when she came, uh, she, be, she, she was then appointed minister for Kampala. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, today we are interacting with her as the new IGG, Honorable Betty Oliver Kamiaturiomwe. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Henry. Yes. And uh, good morning, both of you, Henry and Robert. And I want to good thank the viewers as well. Is it, uh, and I want to thank you for your kind introduction. <laughs> um, you left out one thing, though. Mm -hmm. At the end, I left Uganda Federal Alliance and joined NRM. To complete All right. CV. <laughs> to complete your CV. So she's yes. now a serving member of the NRM, and uh, and so she's uh, 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 <coughs> well grounded in the arena of politics. So um, let's get the show off the ground, uh, lady and gentlemen and gentlemen. So the first question uh, will go to you, Honorable Betty Kamia. Yes. Uh, the Inspectorate of Government uh, that you are leading now has just been recently uh, um, fully constituted. We, 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 we watched and followed the proceedings. So as we speak now, we have a fully constituted Inspectorate of Government. But the Inspectorate of Government has been constituted so many times before. Maybe uh, uh, for, for, for to, 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 to hit uh, this show, uh, uh, um to, 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 to hit the ground running may i request you to 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 share with us what exactly you think uh, that the newly constituted uh inspector of government uh is going to do differently from what the, the previously constituted uh, 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 institutions uh, did not uh, manage to do well thank you once again henry and uh, first of all, I want to thank God for the gift of life and also for uh, this appointment, which was uh, channeled through His Excellency, the President of Uganda, to whom I'm also very grateful. And I speak for my colleagues as well. I also want to note that there's a lot of work that is being done at the inspectorate and that has been done in the inspectorate. Last week, or no, <coughs> this week, Monday, Tuesday, to Wednesday, we had an induction program where uh, the three of us, myself and my deputies, were taken through what the inspectorate is supposed to do and has done and is doing. And we were amazed at the amount of work. I think the missing link was this amount of work does not really go to the public. The public don't get to know. But a lot of money has been saved, a lot of prosecutions have been achieved and are ongoing, and a lot of uh, uh, prevention to corruption is also going on. So I want to pay tribute to my predecessors and also to the team in place for the work they're doing. However, what we have uh, um, what we said when we were staring in before the president and what I'd like to say now is that we are going to also pay a lot of attention to the function of detection and prevention of corruption because I think more attention is being paid uh, to uh, running after the corrupt people, prosecuting them, and punishing them. That will continue. 
but also a lot of attention is now going to be paid to detection and prevention so that at the end of my four years, there will be less coming in uh, as, a, as a, 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 a cases for, for, for prosecution, as more and more awareness, sensitization, and mobilization is happening. We would like to rebrand the war against corruption from being the war of the IGG and the other frontline anti-corruption institutions, as you call them, we would like to rebrand it to be a war of the people. We want to co-opt all Ugandans in this war so that everybody has a role to play. Every Ugandan should feel that they have a role to play and that when they have played their role, they will be appreciated. And at the end of it all, the country, our country, Uganda, will be the winner. So to directly answer your question, we shall continue with prosecution and running after corrupt people, but we shall also put a lot of emphasis on detection and prevention. And we know where to detect, where detection begins. Because by now, all Ugandans know who the store keepers of our money are. Mm -hmm. The store keepers of our money is the permanent secretary, is the cow, is the accounting officer of public institutions. We shall engage them to ask them where they need support to enhance their stewardship. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Kamiya. Robert, let me uh, bring you into this discussion at this juncture. Uh, um, the Honorable Kamiya is saying the war is going to be taken to the people. The people, because in her view, and you may have to, you may agree, I think that uh, she feels that the approach of prevention and the, and the, and the detection is much better than chasing the thieves because. What are you going to do? Put us, throw everybody into jail or what? Which you, you. So, what is your take from your vantage point and having worked in that institution before and from what she, she has shared, which I think uh, is interesting? What is your take? Thank you very much, Henry, and the listeners out there. Uh, Axim, thank you for this, uh, uh, this very important discussion which we are having. And I wish also to take this opportunity to congratulate Honorable Betty Kamia for the appointment, but also the other two colleagues. As Henry said, um, it, the Inspector of Government, uh, I'm so much attached to it because it's the one which ushered me into this career, which I've held for over now 20 years. So I'm very grateful to be seeing you. And uh, Henry, just to get back to the question, I cannot actually agree more with the, uh, the IGG. I think that these are very, very important uh, steps. Uh, probably they may not be new, but uh, the emphasis which is talked about, uh, uh, which is now putting to these two, especially talked about detection, improving detection and prevention. And I think we all know, those who are involved in fighting cr crime, that it is always easier to, pre to, to detect and prevent, and more, actually more cost effectively, cost effective to detect and to prevent something happening, rather than spending a lot of money in the, uh, either prosecution, sanctioning, which sometimes, yes, there could be some uh, convictions, but they may not uh, mitigate the damage. So I think that one is very, very important. Um, and also the second point of the Honorable is uh, very exciting, rebranding the fight. When I was coming here, I wanted to make a few uh, statements, and that was one of them, that no one, including the topmost person, can fight corruption alone. No, institutions, no institution is good enough and well-equipped to address the corruption, because one, corruption happens everywhere, and participating, people are participating in it. So it is better if we put this fight to the people so that we all become part of the fight for anti-corruption. 
And many people will say, but why, what can I do when I don't hold an office? Mm -hmm. uh, before even, I think the first step is for you as an individual not to get involved, just to start, because that one is possible. And when you have done that, then you can mobilize others to do what you have done so that you can be an example when you walk the talk. So I'm very happy just to get back to your question about these two strategies because I believe if well executed, they, will, they, will, they, will, they, will, they may create the, the change which we all want to happen, not only in IG, but in mm. all other public institutions. Thank you, Robert. And of course, uh, you, not, you, you understand that most of the information that uh, the, about the people, uh, the thieves and the, the kind of the wealth they accumulating is always known within the people. The people always know this, except they don't normally uh, believe that when they report, uh, whatever they're reporting will be of, 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 of importance. Now, Honorable Kamiya, um, yes, uh, Henry. But back to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, exciting strategy of rebranding the fight against corruption to make it a, a war of the people, which is very strategic. Uh, it is coming at a time when public trust in the institution is also low. And I, if I recall uh, correctly, the president, uh, I think, uh, as a word of caution, I think he said, go and clean up the house. We do know that you are, you are inheriting a house that needs some purging and cleaning up to do. Maybe um, for you to bring us up to speed with what you are doing to, 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 to purge the house uh, of uh, the, wrong, uh, uh, the rotten apples in order for you to start to build the public trust, in order for the people to, 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 to embark on the bandwagon uh, of, of fighting corruption. Yes, um, Henry. Um, but before I get to that, I really mm. must conclude uh, my previous um, okay. statement by drawing the attention of viewers and mm -hmm. listeners that actually one way to fight a war is to give it a face so that people recognize the enemy and can isolate them. That's a strategy. We fought a war against AIDS. We are fighting a war against COVID. But Winning these wars, we had to identify the enemy. With AIDS, those of you who remember or who have read about it, people started by thinking that it is witchcraft. And they didn't know what to do. They just thought there was witchcraft around until it was identified as a virus that attacks the immune system. And then people and then were also told how to recognize it and how to avoid it. Similarly, with the, with the COVID and other pandemics, because the corruption is a pandemic. Once the pandemic is given a face, then people can join in because they know whom they are fighting. So mm. one of the strategies that we are going to do is to give corruption a face so that mm. people can identify corruption. People should be able easily, the population, without being professionals in administration or investigation or prosecution, they should be able to identify corruption by people's lifestyles, whether their lifestyles are commensurate with the jobs they're doing or commensurate with the money they are earning. Once people know how to identify corruption, the next step is to coach them in what to do about corruption. That is where whistleblowers come in. That is where communities can rise up in local government. That is where communities can reject bad roads, badly constructed schools, you know, uh, um, badly constructed bridges if the communities come out that strongly to report, to reject, to personally get involved, then the mm. war against corruption will be on a firm footing. Now, going back to your question of the weavers in this institution, mm. yes, His Excellency did 
uh, tell us during swearing that he has reports that there is some corruption in the institution and that we need to weed it out. Of course, in the week that I have not I have been here, I cannot say that I've already identified it. But mm. what we need to do here is to strengthen systems, to strengthen procedure, to strengthen adherence to rules and regulations, to strengthen assessment, to mm -hmm. strengthen deliverables, deliverable milestones, deliverable timelines. When we strengthen all that, it will be easy to identify the corrupt people and to whip them out. Some are not even corrupt. They are just incompetent. And mm -hmm. when you are incompetent, you, you, you may be taken to be corrupt because you're not working, because you're not delivering. So this system of strength and adherence to, to, to procedure and systems and regulations will help us to identify, isolate, and weed out the corrupt and the incompetent. Because as I said, not all of them may be corrupt, but they could be just incompetent and they're passed off as corrupt. Because now people, corruption is almost a way of life in Uganda. People think that uh, you can get away with it and, uh, and they take it as it is. So mm -hmm. yes, the, war, the fight against that one in the institution will be to strengthen mm -hmm. uh, work plans and also to monitor closely and supervise people's work plans and deliverables. Robert, uh, you worked in that institution. How yes, were these been we, we was able to, to, fly, to, to fly below the radar and get to infest this institution? And uh, how ca can one, you know, you know party them out? Thank you very much. Um, I think to begin with, Inspectorate of government, people who work for Inspectorate of government are part of the society. And uh, expecting that uh, people of the Inspectorate of government are going completely to, to behave differently when maybe other colleagues who in the other institutions are not behaving the same way. Mm. It is like wishful thinking because the, we, we, we also need to realize that uh, the society itself, uh, where which is the pond, the big pond, where we fish from, has to be, there should be some work done in that, and so that we can get the good people. However, you also have to know that, uh, um, like the IG and any other institutions, I think the challenge has always been in recruitment. Whether it's a civil society, whether it is what, it's the, the, the corruption, the internal corruption is not only in the inspectorate of government. It's almost in all institutions. It is public institutions, it is the civil society, it is in the private sector, but most of the time, the challenge is always on recruitment. Because, um, and I've been saying this many times, that when we go for interviews, the only thing people look around for is whether you articulate, whether you are competent, but they never do the background check. So they, we get rotten mangoes already, into the system. When we get rotten mangoes into the system, the process of purifying them, even when we are talking about system, which is still okay, and I agree with the water go, the systems, the internal monitoring, but the entry point is key. To what extent are you understanding the people you are bringing on board? They are good accountants, fine, they are good lawyers, but what is their moral, moral, moral background? To what extent have you proved them to be people whom we are going to choose and work with in such a sensitive office or in such a company where you want to have results. So I know that the internal systems, the word are very important, but I also think that whoever is an employer there and wants to, integrity should count at the entry point. How do you do that? We can go into that into the details because some organizations do it. They do integrity tests. They investigate people before they join in. But someone who's corrupt in one office does well in the other. I mean, just cross over. All the time they are crossing over. And when you cross over, you bring your habits into the system. 
So I know that when you work for inspectorate of government, you are supposed to be exemplary. But sometimes that, that exemplary culture does not just come. There must be a lot of work being done in order to ensure that even when we sieve, we try by sieving out the right people. When they come, we train them well, we, um, we supervise them well. But the most important thing is what Honor was saying, working with the community. Because people know who is corrupt. Even when you work with IG right now or previously, even the officers in the Inspector of Government, they know who is corrupt. They know. It's public knowledge. But the challenge is, what do you do with that? What do we do? Where do you take them? Are they going to be sanctioned? Are you safe? How are you managing your own risk? So if you are with the public, the public will tell you, Robert Lugori was here at the district and was paid money. And maybe they have evidence. Even the other people who are paying, if they get to know that you have a system, they will report. They will report. And you will be able to. So working with the other stakeholders mm. is a very important thing. Not only for IG, but all of us, including mm. all the civil society, because they also mm. need clean people mm. into these offices. Right. Let me go back to Honorable Bet Kamia. Uh, Robert, you almost alluded to it. Uh, Whereas corruption seems to have picked on, uh, taken a, a, a more sophisticated uh, dimension uh, over the years, the actors that engage in this corruption seem to remain the same. From the layman's uh, viewpoint, we think these are uh, people that uh, are well connected to the corridors of power. And therefore, for political corruption, we think we, and believe at this day and age is one of the, of the, of the greatest challenges we are facing. Uh, you and us, the citizens, <coughs> are, are, are eager to join you in this fight. How are you going to handle these, you know, some of these individuals that think they are larger than life and yet their names keep uh, showing up in scandals? You know, uh, Ro uh, Robert is right in most of what he said. But a thief, <laughs> if he finds the store locked with a strong padlock. Even the, thief, the, the thieving in him will not happen because the store is properly locked, the, the padlock is strong, and the keys are safely uh, held by someone. So that is what prevention is about. You may not stop people's, the, the building of morals is one of the way to fight corruption. And we have institutions that should do that, although all of us can support the religious institutions, the patriotism uh, efforts, and uh, even the home grooming. They should try to uh, 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 build. We need moral armament for sure. Mm -hmm. There must be some efforts in moral rearmament. But my job, because I can't do everything, my job will be to try to detect and to prevent. Even the people who have no morals, my job is to prevent them. I probably don't have the tools to preach to them about their morals but I have the tools to prevent them from stealing. And when they steal, I have the tools to catch them and punish them. So I'm going to use the tools at my disposal. But mm. I do agree that uh, the moral rearmament is another story that we need to talk about as a country. And you know, like we said, it's even a way of life Kids want to go to, to, to vie for position of the monitor and the teachers encourage them to bring sweets. To, and so whoever has more sweets will probably get the vote, even if they do not have the ability to be a leader. And parents give them the money or the parent even buys the sweets and whoever has the most expensive sweets will mm. take. That's how mm. far down mm. it goes. So uh, the question of moral armament 
is a very big question and it must be taken down to the young people, to the primary kids of this country, to be able also to recognize the face of corruption and reject it and fight it. I totally agree, but there are many ways we can't just follow one route of recruiting. Somebody may have wonderful morals, but he doesn't have the technical and professional know-how to handle an office. You know, of course, there will be somebody who might have both. It is good to look out for somebody who, 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 who has both. But when somebody rots along the way, because even a fresh mango, it begins as a raw, beautiful, fresh mango, and along the way, it, it, it gets rotten. What do you do with that one? Because the world is not a, a straight uh, field, uh, football field, which you can uh, predict how it's going to be and, and how it, where, which you can all see on one plane. No, even people change along the way. But my job as the, as the inspector at IGG is to detect, to prevent, to prosec investigate, to prosecute, and to get convictions where necessary and possible. And the tools are there. I'm just saying we are going to make sure that the tools are employed to do that work. Right. Uh, still with you, Honorable Bet Kamia. Uh, the ordinary Ugandan uh, has uh, has issues with the uh, public offices, and one of the of the of the common uh, challenges they confront they are confronted with is, for example, uh, at the, at the level of police across the country, bond police bond is a cash cow. They they their people get to be arrested and they have to keep coughing and and selling off their things to pay. In courts of law, to get bail, you have to pay. Bail is also a cash cow. And this is happening outside Kampala in those uh, upcountry courts. How are you, uh, how can, what kind of hope can you uh, give to the Mutua Wansi who is confronted with these things? But also, maybe as you, you, you answer, there's also an issue of, of, of district land offices which get to be involved in these, uh, you know, uh, corruption scandals uh, around here, Kampala. We know the case of Wakiso, which doesn't seem to have been concluded. But this, the district land office of Wakiso is, the, is a replica of other district land offices. The corruption that is manifested that, uh, that is and infested in those institutions is, uh, is despicable. What kind of, uh, what hope can you give to our viewers um, who are faced with the, these challenges on a daily basis? Uh, true. Police bonds have really become a cash cow. And I hope that uh, what, what we are planning to do is to raise everybody's consciousness about the role they have to do, including those in supervisory roles. So we shall engage, because corruption is in all arms of government, and like you said, in the private sector as well. We hope or we plan to engage the executive through the prime minister, the right honorable prime minister. When we meet the right honorable prime minister, we'll say something like there's corruption in the government under your watch. And the ministers under the prime minister their level of consciousness and political oversight must be challenged and raised. You are supervisors of your ministries. What, how, how, how does corruption happen under your watch? The, you speak to the chief justice and say there's corruption in the judiciary under your watch. Speak to the speaker. There is corruption in the parliament under your watch. Let us now work together mm. to identify mm. the type of corruption that is in your institution. And it begins by accepting. Once you resist or deny, then the problem will not be solved. Or the doctor cannot give the right.
prescription. So as I said from the beginning, mobilization of the community to get involved in this war will begin with the leadership of this country. It is not just at the IGG war, but the prime minister, the ministers, members of parliament, cows, permanent secretaries, down to the average person. Everybody's consciousness must be raised. I mean, I am so, really I want to pay tribute sometime to the media. They do raise these issues, but when they raise the issues, they just go to, to, to the archives as media stories. There is a big story today in the, in the Daily Monitor of about 9 billion shillings, which was wired to schools, I mean to uh, institutions in the Ministry of Agriculture during the COVID lockdown. And according to the Monitor story, it says that some of the money is said to have been sent to pay for learners' um, food during lockdown, when they have, not been, they have not been any learners. So I am going to take interest in this story and investigate it if there's merit, if I find merit, and it's just, not just a newspaper story, and investigate it. So if we all rise up and make ourselves alert, because if such a story comes up like that, it should be maybe the top leadership, I don't want to point fingers at anybody, of the institution who should raise the, the, the flag and say, I need an investigation in this one. And like you said, recently, of course, I was minister, minister for lands. And in the ministry of lands, as everybody knows, there's a very, very dirty story or many dirty stories. I'm sure that the ministers will, will, will play their part because I passed on all my findings in my report to the minister. And I can see, I know that the minister is doing his best. But what I found out in the Ministry of Lands was mainly issues of supervision. They are not supervised. They just do their work, this minimum supervision in the land offices. And so, you know, if you don't supervise, then people relax, 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 until they just open the doors and everybody can enter. So uh, to answer your question, we are going to mobilize people, but also to raise the consciousness of the supervisors to up their game. If you are sleeping on the job, please minister, you are the political head supervisor of that ministry. How is the money being stolen under your nose? Are you sleeping on the job? Please wake up. Let us work together. Be the one to ask for an investigation in your ministry. Not just say, ah, the technical people are the ones who know that. We're just going to ask everybody to up their game. Thank you very much, Honorable. Uh, Robert, you worked in the, in, that, in the inspectorate of government and there's a staff there. But of course, also as a, as a man who is uh, well grounded, even academically, on issues of anti-corruption. This issue of supervision, which seems to be the biggest deficit, because sit, people just sit in offices. Either they are incompetent or they are syndicating with those that are you know, grabbing and, and stealing on, on industrial scale. Bring us up to speed. How do you go about getting people that are supposed to do the supervisory work and do their work? Do you just get rid of them? Do you train them? Do, what do you, how do you approach a scenario like this one? Thank you, Henry, and the viewers, and uh, honorable for all um, what has been spoken about. This supervision is key. And uh, I think for every institution, they invest heavily in supervision. Uh, yeah, and uh, it can be done in many ways, training people, I mean, putting uh, controls and uh, targets and all those kind of things. But I think the, the, the biggest challenge with anti-corruption uh, 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 fight in this country that we don't take stock and review our approaches and find out 
what has worked, what has not worked, why it has not worked, so that at the end of the day, we come up with the well-based and evidenced approaches to anti-corruption. Because we are talking about corruption, which is a very complex issue. When you are talking about supervision, just to, just to, to, to take you on what you are saying, who, who is supervising? Whose interest? Are the supervisors clean? Are they not part of the scam? Who is that minister? <laughs> is that minister very interested in the integrity and the world management of that institution? Is he convinced or is she convinced? Is he a convicted person that this country requires and needs people who are going to be working for others? Or the motivation even for joining politics and holding offices is about the money. It's about creating wealth for individuals. What about issues around, um, around uh, impunity? What about when they see others doing almost similar things and they're not punished? What will happen if, if others do it and others, when they do, when they do it, you sanction them? So I think a lot of debate, like Honda uh, was saying, we really need to go to the ground and I mean to the roots and say, what can we do together as a country? How can we address issues which are which we are grappling with in respect to this uh, this anti corruption? One of them is is impunity. Those whom we have allowed to do these things, and they seem not to be able to even to touch them. And impunity is not only actually in very high offices. Impunity even are even impunity is actually in even small offices. So if we are to start and ignite this fight, then we have to get back to the basics. Henry, I don't know whether you, you got lost on the way. You got lost on the way. You got yes. <laughs> yes. Henry, you may have got lost on the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sabotu was around the way. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, um, yeah, you had finished your submission, right? I don't know where you stopped. I don't know where I, because at a certain <laughs> point I was talking without you, so I don't know. Anyway. He was saying, uh, Henry, yes. Robert was saying, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So where do we begin? I mean, we are the Ugandans here. We must, uh, we must repent, all of us, and decide to rebuild our country, to rebuild the morals. And the morals, really, We'll start in, while we fight now, corruption, but elimination will begin with the morals of the young people, mm. the young people. Mm. But even young people left alone. I mean, we know young people, like now they say, when they're in school, because there's supervision, they don't get pregnant. Because there's supervision. When they go home, they're getting pregnant, because there's no supervision. It's the same person. It's not as if the person who is in school has higher morals than the kid who is at home. It's just as more supervision at school than supervision at home. So the art, the responsibility, and the work of supervision must be apt. But people must take also responsibility. And I think that uh, at some point, the Ministry of uh, public service might have to reconsider the, or, uh, the, the, the management of performance appraisal. Just appraising people at the end of the year and putting files in the archives should not be working anymore. Appraisals must be for a reason. We should see people uh, rewarded for good performance. We should also pe see people penalized for poor performance. So uh, we, that's what I'm saying. Supervision, which also goes with performance assessment and also the results of the performance assessment. I mean, in the government and many institutions, there is a end of year assessment, a routine exercise, which mm. costs money. But at the end mm. of the day, the files are there. And who, does the, the, 
the assessment. I'll give you an example of an institution where I was, which I will not say, where I had a driver. And my driver, at the end of the year, I heard that my, brother, my driver was the best employee of the year. And nobody asked me. I am the one he drives. I am the one who knows whether he keeps time or doesn't keep time, or whether he keeps the car clean, or whether he does what. I was not even asked, but I had. And he was a good driver. I would vouch for him. I would say that, yes, he does a good job, but I wasn't asked. So I think we need to reevaluate who assesses, and when the performance is done, first of all, it should be objective and fair, and there should be mechanism to make it objective and fair so that people don't use it as a tool to gain advantage over others or punish others. It must be designed like a management tool intended to raise performance and deliverables for this country. So the question of performance appraisal should be given serious attention. So on that point of performance appraisal, we are going to go for a very short break. And when we come back, we are going to talk matters uh, leadership code act and the tribunal. The monster of money politics is eating up Uganda's democracy. When you take money from a candidate, it means you are feeding the monster. Then you become a part of the problem. When a candidate who overspends on campaigns is elected, he or she will not represent voters but himself. He or she will engage in corruption to recover campaign money. Social services will not be delivered and the voter will suffer more. Voter, let's be wise. Give democracy a chance. Do not sell your vote. Focus on the issue. My point, my issue. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, our viewers. We are back, uh, and we are talking matters concerning whether government is winning the war on corruption. And of course, we are joined by two eminent uh, uh, sons and daughters of the soil. Um, among them, uh, the Honorable Olive, Betty Oliver Kamia, the newly uh, appointed IGG, who has come with the uh, who has come to, into the office almost guns blazing and of course then uh, uh, the activist academic on matters of anti-corruption mr robert rubolovi uh, honorable bet kamia let me uh, come to you um uh, i hope you are on set you know uh, yes i am yes now um the leadership code we know that uh, there are uh, um, efforts to uh, um uh, put in place and, and actualize the leadership code uh, tribunal okay um but when you look at the manner in which these, these these declarations are being made they are not publicly accessible uh you want to take the word to the people so that it is us the people that are fighting the corrupt but we not we don't get to see the declarations that are being made yet it is us who know which officer owns what? We know their are, they are assets. We know their wealth. We talk about this when we are having a beer, and that's where he, he stopped. So how, how, in your view, do you think we can give a cutting edge to the leadership code? That when these, uh, uh, even when the tribunal, first of all, do you think the tribunal is, uh, is the, the missing link? Number two, how do we give it cutting edge as the leadership code? that that we get to help with the institutional inspectorate of government uh with providing and, and volunteering information on the wealth of these men and women which they often hide 
so that you uh, you know the, the code can be an intervention of, of some consequence well um, <clears throat> first of all there is the right to privacy is a, a value that we <clears throat> that we subscribe to in this country the leadership court among other things is intended to help uh, government or the inspectorate of government to keep record of your assets and to track them so that you can account for for them so it's like a, a library it's like a library you go to the library when you want to read something but the library just because they want people to read will not put books along the roadside but throw them in the road because you want everybody to be educated to read but you should know that should you need information the library is the place to go you'll find the information there and it is a reliable information so i do not think that it is right to publish people's uh, uh, wealth just because they're public servants, but they should be recorded so that we can track your progress or your, your acquisition or, or non-acquisition of assets, or, 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 or of your assets. So the archives, the records are there in the case of need. But like you said, when somebody in when when there is need then we get out even the most things i mean like the penal code or the bible of everything you pull the right the relevant section of the penal code to use it during a relevant case you know you don't just throw the whole penal code there or in the bible you pull out the relevant verses to be used at the right time. Even the leadership court, people have all these uh, declarations they make. One is psychological, so that you know that now government knows what I have. It is on record. And you also know that false declaration is the crime under the law of Uganda. So that psychological knowledge alone helps you to, or rather uh, uh, manages you to manage yourself. And it, it, it also helps because people, even people who are corrupt and steal things, they fidget, that fidgeting alone to hide the building under somebody's name who may take it, fidgeting to hide money, fidgeting, that alone is, is a tool that helps government to, uh, to track or to stop people from being corrupt. But in my view, I think it is right that, um, uh, that uh, there should be a record to be used only when it is required not for public consumption anytime. Uh, that is my view, and I think that is, uh, th that is th the mind behind uh, the, the, the leadership call. <coughs> Robert, Robert, let me seek your, your, your views on this one, because today uh, we know that most of our leaders have now mastered the art of managing offshore accounts. They have of offshore businesses without public scrutiny. Uh, do you think the leadership code, uh, as, as, as it is, uh, will have enough teeth to, to bite? Thank you very much, Henry. I think the, the, the first challenge I mentioned, I can mention it again, that uh, most of our interventions are not based on uh, reviews, research, um, good practices. That's why we come up with them. And many times you know, it's a copy and paste, and uh, when we bring them, we never review them to evaluate why maybe they have not served the purpose and what can be fixed. 
So whether leadership code or whatever, and I know that in, in this country there are people who believe that uh, all countries all over the world cannot de leaders are not declaring publicly, and because they have not actually, uh, they have not bothered even to read and research about those countries. That's where leadership code have had effects or positive effects. But what I want to tell you that. Uh, you know, these are very complex matters. I, I was watching uh, or reading uh, an article, I think it was Nigeria, when somebody was saying, the moment you're a public servant, uh, there are some rights you have to forego. Um, that was his view, and I still believe that in one way or the other, you have to go back to the designers of the Leadership Code Act who introduced these declarations and say, what do they want to achieve? If, if, if he's going to be on request, why... Um, do I have the capacity to cross-check all the information that has been given? I know for us in research, we say don't collect any information you don't have purpose for or you don't have intention of using. It is going to be a waste of money and time if I ever collect data, which I'm not going to be using uh, promptly, especially timely. So the, the debate of leadership code and what should be, to a man of view, we should really, we should really, we should really be thinking about it, and also get the the, 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 the what the good practice. Is. Because I know some countries who have made it in public, you can actually go right now on the internet and check on the declaration of powerful leaders, very very powerful people, not only in their own countries but in the world, and you can get it just by 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 click of uh, of of the button of the computer. So, I mean, we are still living this, in this country, and I agree to a certain extent, there is this whatever of not sharing information, and it's part of us, a secrecy. But we also know, or we should know, that that secret has a part to play in terms of our failure to address corruption. So how can we be debating to find, a, you know, some kind of consensus, some kind of uh, convergence? on how do we use this information. Right now, I think the law was amended to include all public servants are declaring. How many are they? They are quite a number. How many people in the inspectorate of government have been assigned <coughs> to be looking at those declarations? What is their capacity? What is their resource base? So the moment people, you know, corruption is a very complex issue. And the people who are involved in corruption are watching the moment they get to know that you have non designed a system of detecting, like Honorable said, you don't have it, but you are collecting information for the sake of fulfilling uh, uh, maybe a, a legal requirement, then they will not be bothered. Let me tell you one thing. I don't think, and I, I don't think that's my personal view, that there are many people, if there are any anywhere, who are very, very much scared about the leadership code. I mean, declare Because... If I don't declare what I, if I don't declare, for example, if I want me to declare today, and I don't declare fully my, my assets, what is going to happen? What are the chances that I will be landed on, and I will be picked, and I will be followed? I know someone is going to tell you that, you know, we do routine, every year we verify. But you would ask that person, how many people are involved? How many people were covered last year, or two years, in terms of those who declared? What are the percentage of the people who declared and their assets were verified? And the process of verifying, how intensive was it that the people who are likely to be knowing this person's assets were actually involved? Why how is that process being done in order to create the impact you want? Because you never put a measure which you are not going to perfect. That will be a wastage. And in my own view, you rather not have it than having something which is just a monumental. <laughs> no, 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 Robert. You, you want to Robert, rebuttal this honorable. As yeah. they say, Rome was not built in a day. And I think once you have one step, you built one step, you don't destroy it because I cannot, I've not yet built the second step. You build on it. All the things that Robert has said are right. And we can certainly improve on the management and usage of the leadership code. But the principle of having everybody declare their wealth is good. It's like saying, Robert, if the law says, 
don't steal. It is there waiting for the thief. You can't say because I haven't caught a thief. One day it will catch, it will catch the thief. And when you catch the thief, the law is there. But you know you cannot accuse anybody in Uganda for anything outside the penal code. So if you don't have a declaration of the penal code, of the of, of assets, if you don't have a declaration, how would you even start to accuse anybody for amassing illicit wealth over a period when you don't have that law in place? So I think for Robert to say, we'd rather not have it at all, is I have agreed with you so far, Robert, and I really sympathize with your frustration. It is our frustration. It is a national frustration. But let us give credit to whatever foundation has been laid and built on it. Yes, there are so many people, but now if everybody played their role, then the leadership court or the declaration of assets will be put to better use. You know that so-and-so does a, is, a, is, a, is a, a junior officer in a ministry, but he has got a set of apartments eh, costing billions. So you go and report that person and we check whether those apartments were even declared. Most likely he will not even declare. But I can cross-check with the KCCA whether he's the one who applied for a building, uh, um, what do they call it, plans. I can cross-check with Minister of Lands, whose, whose land that uh, belongs to. I can, I can cross-check with many other um, records of government and put things together. So this is an extra mile in fighting corruption, the fact that people are required to declare their wealth. Certainly it's not the end. We should work, we should, we should, we should build on it, but we should admit that it is a good start. Thank you very much. Uh, our time is fast spent. Honorable Betkami, I'm going to uh, ask you to make to give us your parting shots, your conclusive remarks, um, and then I'll, I'll go, go to Robert. Well, um, Henry, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, participate in this very interesting discussion. An honor. An honor. And Robert, I want to thank you very much for your passion and for your activism. I know that activists do so with passion. So <laughs> I want to thank you and for your contribution. Mm. And this is what I want to tell the people mm. of, uh, what I would like to tell the people of Uganda. Mm. And it was what the president said. The president said when we were sharing in, is that the war against corruption is actually easy to fight because the people are tired of corruption and they want it out. We want to personalize corruption, the, the cost of corruption, so that people know that I am the one they are stealing from. My mother died because there was no medicine in the hospital because that man is driving a bus which is out of corruption. And we make that person accountable. So we shall reach every sitting room, we shall reach every classroom, we shall reach every institution with the message of corruption is bad and me as an individual can do something about its elimination if we all chip in our best or even a piece of what we can do corruption we shall have a long we're talking to the people from Denmark and they told us that they've been at it for 300 years but we don't have to and yet there's still some pockets of corruption but we don't have to wait for 300 years because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can do what they have done. All we need is willpower and support from everybody else. Thank you very much. Indeed, 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 indeed. And people of Uganda, it's a call. Join the Gwanga Muje. We're going to call it Gwanga Muje. Gwanga Muje, I've sounded the clarion call. Join the war against corruption. Mm. Mm. Robert, your parting shot. Thank you very much, uh, Henry Akfim, the civil society, and uh, thank you, Honorable. 
Uh, I think we agree on so many things, uh, especially bringing on board uh, almost everyone. But I also want to make this statement that uh, we need to address impunity because uh, it draws back the people who would have wanted to come and, and join them. They don't want to see the untouchables walking around while others are, be, uh, are being fought. I think that's one of the areas which we need to, to all of us agree that let us go and be committed and have the will to clean up this country because it is possible. The corrupt are known. Can and corruption... Touch us for one second. As mm, if yes, 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 please, yes. I want to talk mm. about because the untouchables is what annoys people so, so, so much. And this has been my answer to them. The person who gave me this job is the president of Uganda. He's the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. He's the one who is most frustrated with corruption. He has put in his manifesto to stamp out corruption in this term of five years. So based on all that, in my vocabulary, there is no untouchable. And there will be no untouchable. This is a war for Uganda, and we are not going to, 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 uh, to accept anybody called untouchable. Unless I get a list from parliament, and from cabinet, this is a list of untouchables. Don't touch. <laughs> then I will put in my file and inform my staff and inform the whole country. Thank you. So, so all of you untouchables, you have had. There is no untouchable <laughs> here. <laughs> so, I think our time is fast spent. Uh, we, I think we should have another opportunity to to discuss on this matter because uh, um, it's a matter of national concern. I let me take the opportunity to thank you, Honorable Betty Kamiya, for honoring our invitation. It's been an honor for us to host, to host you. Uh, my, my, my brother, Robert Ugorov, who have been fighting trenches, uh, corruption in the trenches together. He's an activist. I am an activist. We hate corruption, Honorable Betty Kamiya. We don't like yes. it. Uh, us and the corruption don't coexist. So uh, thank you, Robert, for joining. And we hope we shall have another opportunity to share yeah, our insights with the, the, the citizens. The viewers, thank you very much for uh, uh, staying with us uh, until until now, and uh, until we meet again next week. Let me wish you a very uh, lovely weekend. I thank you and the goodbye for now. Thank you. Mm. The monster of money politics is eating up Uganda's democracy. When you take money from a candidate, it means you are feeding the monster. Then you become a part of the problem. When a candidate who overspends on campaigns is elected, he or she will not represent voters but himself. He or she will engage in corruption to recover campaign money. Social services will not be delivered and the voter will suffer more. Voter, let's be wise. Give democracy a chance. Do not sell your vote. Focus on the issue.